No problem. So like I said, today um, we're pre presenting on behalf of Trimble um, and I work for Altera Central. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation. Rusty is joining us today on behalf of Haffen Associates. He is the team geospatial leader for Haffen Associates. He's got 16 years of experience in the geospatial services. He's an FAA remote pilot, um, Autodesk certified instructor, and you saw all of his software prof proficiencies there. But uh, the title of our presentation is Mobile LiDAR, We've Got You Covered. You know, we're gonna jump into the mobile LiDAR side of it, and we're definitely gonna take a deep dive into that. But we also wanted to take a quick look at on the photogrammetry side and you know, terrestrial scanning as well before we jump into the mobile LiDAR side. And we'll kind of pick up on those questions or uh, hit those questions you had in the beginning there, Gavin. Uh, I think those will come up during the presentation. Let you take it away there, Rusty. Thanks, Billy. Yeah, great presentation. I got to catch the one before and uh, so much of what I'm going to talk about uh, parallels that. Um, we are going to focus specifically on mobile LiDAR, but, you know, uh, we are tasked at HAF and, and the, the folks that Trimble and Altera work with, a lot of them are tasked now to build complete uh, point cloud data sets. And uh, so um, although we're going to focus on mobile and, and, uh, and that's our primary area of emphasis, we, we have to do uh, manned ac aerial acquisition, drone aerial acquisition, and terrestrial to build that um, holistic, complete uh, point cloud data set that many of our clients are asking for. They're under underside of bridges or behind a construction zone, things like that. We have to use other tools as well. So I'm not going to do a deep dive here, but basics of, uh, of manned aircraft um, and photogrammetry, many of you know. In fact, uh, I love that some of these previous presentations are hitting on them. A lot of overlap on imagery, obviously. Um, so both uh, man photogrammetry and LIDAR, I'm showing you here. LIDAR obviously uh, helping us with vegetation as the previous presenter talked about. Um, and, I'll, and I'll hit into that more in depth when we talk about angle of incident. Um, so we have uh, a whole slew of uh, drones, uh, some LiDAR based, some photogrammetric. We, uh, we do not own um, aircrafts. We sub that work out here at HAF, but we utilize them on many projects. When it makes sense, you know, we all know the discussion of the right tool out of the toolbox. Um, again, just some wanted to pepper you with, uh, we have to understand um, uh, doing the top-down collection as it fits the project. Uh, we we like using the drone LiDAR a lot because uh, we feel we can efficiently and safely get out. Um, there are times where, you know, maybe the mobile LiDAR based on the elevations of the, the road and where the ditch elevations are, we like the ability to uh, take the drone LiDAR out on in the back of the mobile LiDAR vehicle and uh, do some additional um, acquisition uh, low and slow um, and, and kind of getting down into vegetated areas with uh, with the drone LiDAR to supplement our heavy mobile data set. And so, I, again, I wanted to pepper you. Here's just an example of a 350-acre um, South Texas uh, campus. This is a photogrammetric model, um, but it's a point cloud, which most of, many of you know well, um, but this was acquired in uh, in one day in the field, 350 acres roughly. Um, so a lot of benefits to the aerial usage. Um, just again, a, a quick look at some of those. And uh, so I'm going to show you some some projects towards the end of the presentation where we're utilizing, we're doing a hybrid data collection where we're utilizing terrestrial data drone data and the bulk of the work is our mobile acquisition and we're, and we're tying it all together. So obviously there's reasons why you would use terrestrial um, scanning, whether it's the inside of a facility or, but for, if we're focused on assets and 
and topography, you know, the un as I mentioned earlier, the underside of bridges, the backside of um, what we'll call um, undrivable areas like in an urban downtown situation. Um, we're even doing culvert uh, scanning whenever it makes sense. The example I just showed you. So here's just a quick example of one of our terrestrial um, point clouds. Uh, it's interesting for me when we think of the term assets. I, I, I kept chewing on assets, like what are assets? And, and I, I think there's a lot that, that applies there. So, But I'm going to focus mostly on uh, corridor type assets, but I wanted to just show a quick little fly through of a terrestrial scan and level of detail that as many of you know, you're going to get from one of them. As we move on out of terrestrial scanning and uh, into the bulk of the presentation, mobile LIDAR. And uh, I won't spend much time in, in bathymetric, um, but I just wanted to show, you know, that's also another method of acquisition that we are expected to, uh, to add into our topographic DTMs that we that we create. And none of this is possible without our, our uh, survey friends. Um, uh, I'm, I am a part of the survey group here at HALF. We have about 100 surveyors across the, the company. We, we, we work with uh, Southern United States. Uh, we have offices all over the Southern United States. And uh, we, um, we focus on, on making sure our field guys understand geospatial acquisition and uh, so that they, when they're out there the initial time, they can uh, be paying attention to obscure areas and uh, be thinking about good areas for ground truthing. Uh, the previous presentation did a great job of, of showing those accuracy reports. Uh, often in Oklahoma, we call them OS, OSSDA check shots, uh, but that was derived from NSSDA check shots that, that Asper's um, points us to and uh, we we uh, we try to put a focus on on that with our projects and and validating our data, much like you saw just previously in the last presentation. So as we focus down into uh, our mobile mapper, the Trimble MX9, which we purchased not too long ago at my previous company, I had a different mobile mapper and did a lot of homework and uh, really tried to focus in on uh, getting one that that brings us value uh, in a lot of different ways and um, one of my favorite things and, and as I talked to my former coworkers, I teased them about one of my favorite things about the mobile mapper um, the the Trimble's MX-9 is its flexibility and that we can put it on different types of vehicles um, I don't have examples of putting it on a boat uh, or a golf cart in here but uh, they're out there if you guys uh, search for them um, so again, easy to install. Um, it's just a, it's a it's a great system, very compact and uh, very flexible for us. Um, it's got the Regal units on it. We have uh, the the top of the line of Planet AP60 on it. Um, so we're using Pause Pack for our trajectories, and uh, we also have the GAMS and DMI that we uh, feel bring tremendous value. In, when necessary in areas of uh, poor solution, GNSS um, solution concerns, be it urban canyons or uh, rural areas uh, with vegetate, tall vegetation or things like that. So um, as I said, very compact. Um, most of the, the information um, that actually pretty much everything on the system is what you're seeing here. You're seeing that iPad there on the left it can be a laptop or different things, but uh, we 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 typically have a dedicated iPad that we use. You're getting a lot of real time feedback. Um, the Ladybug camera, which I'm going to emphasize here in a little bit, which is fairly common for mobile mappers, um, is a part of the system, and you're you're getting uh, imagery real time as well as uh, uh, as your sky plots and all your GNSS solutions, so you can. Uh, feel confident that you've uh, um, prepared your IMU for acquisition prior to data collection. Um, you know, kind of that smart, smart driving uh, wake up uh, um, thought that 
so many mobile mappers and even drone acquisition and, and aerial acquisition, um, kind of our focus. Uh, um, not, uh, I would say I, about 50-50 on how many of the mobile mappers are going to do this butterfly pattern, but there are many that are out there that aren't doing it. Um, in fact, we have a, uh, an older, more uh, smaller system that's a single uh, sensor, which you'll see a picture of here in a second, which is not doing the butterfly pattern. And there's um, a lot of value in getting that, uh, that you know, as I kind of think of it as an X driving down the road behind your mobile mapper, getting weight, uh, a, a wake like behind a boat. And uh, it just, it saves a tremendous amount of time as far as data shadowing goes, whether there's, as you're seeing here, vehicles blocking or other obstructions. Um, so a lot of value in the X pattern. So here's an example of the if your sensor was not in that butterfly formation, um, how you're going to acquire data and just a lot more shadowing going on there, a lot more challenges um, typically takes uh, quite a bit longer to acquire a, as I said at the initial presentation, a full data set without holes in it. Um, so I, I, I mentioned the DMI and games briefly, but um, they are working in collaboration with the IMU INS system um, to uh, to inform inform the system of uh, in areas of, of of outage or poor solution to help correct the data sets. Um, so the the IMU is helping in a lot of ways. I like to tell um, you know maybe inexperienced uh, folks that the IMU is correcting as the vehicles jostling and moving around. So think as you're going around this NASCAR bank at 70 miles an hour, well, the IMU is, is uh, help, helping uh, the system correct that data in real time so that you get a, a data set that, you know, there's a lot of discussion on without survey control, which we, you, the last presentation just drove home control and, and I, we're surveyors, that's where we're at too, very, very, uh, very critical. And we typically don't do a job without survey control, but, for the, the, the GIS folks that are on here, you know, you're going to get, um, especially with good solution with this system, you're, you're, you're going to get uh, data sets, raw data sets, let's call it, um, because of all this equipment that's on here within a couple of tenths. You're going to be, you know, 15 hundredths to, to two tenths, somewhere in there, uh, a raw data set if you've, if you've done all the proper steps. Um, um, and then in areas where you get poor solution, um, you know, you, you can start to slide out of that. But it, but the DMI and the GAMs um, are going to do a lot to hold through if you pass through tunnels. Um, obviously, you still have to have control in these areas, but uh, all these systems together um, build us out a raw data set that's almost ready. And then um, oftentimes our survey control is just some finite adjustments to lock it down. So there at the top in the right, you're seeing the ladybug camera. I, um, but before I move on, the uh, rocket launchers um, you're seeing right here, uh, there's one here and one on the other side. Those are the two um, regals. They have uh, they have caps on them right there, so you're not seeing the, the glass and the laser in there. But um, So the ladybug camera... Um, we're a big fan of. So the MX-9 has more than that. It also has additional cameras like one in the back, which is a downward facing pavement um, camera looking at cracking and things like that. But the my colleague who put this video together, um, sh he, sh he likes to show it in this manner and he also shows it in this way. I don't think in this way, I like the Google Earth Street View where it's uh, the spherical globe. So the ladybug camera is doing that as well. And that's how I like to digest the imagery. Um, but so one of our favorite things, actually our clients' favorite things, the engineers, is that not only can we provide this topography, the CAD deliverable that you're used to, we can even give them the full-blown point cloud, but they love the, um, the mobile mapper's uh, current good resolution, uh, essentially Google Earth-like street view imagery that they can um, dive into and, uh, and, and kind of right out of the gate start doing that. In the Ladybug software that I just showed there, um, Ladybug Cat Pro is freeware. So we can, uh, 
we can give them the executable and give them the data and they can dive right into a data set on their computer. Um, so before I move on, this is the sensor, the other sensor I mentioned. Um, we, we typically are using it on a drone, but uh, we have a, a good setup where we can put it on the back of a vehicle too, where it makes sense, or like I say, a golf cart or an ATV backpack. And uh, so it's a good Swiss Army knife sensor. But again, smaller sensor, um, uh, IMU's not quite as good as what the MX-9 is providing. And uh, so the data sets aren't quite as pristine as what you're gonna see from the MX-9. So uh, I always like to, to show TRB's um, applications of mobile mapping because it's so vast. Uh, I love uh, the pavement deformation. I've got to do several of those projects. That's, I will show you briefly some of that. Obviously all the asset um, extraction and things we're talking about, ADA compliance. So, you know, you drive an entire city and you can analyze all their ramps uh, that were visible from, from driving and, uh, and give them a GIS analysis of all of that. So a lot of applications. Um, I, I suspect all of us on here know what a point cloud is, um, but uh, just because I feel like it's the right thing to do, there's an ex example of one, you know, it's just millions and billions of survey points and we can uh, apply different view styles to it so we can see uh, things like intensity or we can apply imagery to it to view it in an RGB uh, style that makes sense to our eyes. But essentially it's an ASCII file, an XYZ file, just like you would expect from a survey, um, just millions and millions of points. Um, so just wanted to touch on survey control like our friends um, Compass did in the last presentation. Um, we have a preferred method. Um, we with our mobile mapper, we really like the uh, the checkerboard like this, and we like to point it um, towards towards the road to where the tip of it is perpendicular to the road. We we it's not catastrophic if control is done in other ways, but we have uh, tested it many ways, and uh, and and Trimble as well, and we see the value in setting it up a particular way. So speaking of Trimble, um, some of these screenshots you're seeing in here are based on their experiences and uh, opinion as well. So I've mixed that in as well. Um, some, some other methods, uh, you know, just as we think about aerial acquisition on control, I always leave this slide in here, you know, table method uh, often applies. So that's kind of what I'm showing you here, but focus on mobile mapping. Um, generally, we're, if, we, if we feel we're having good solution, we'll stretch our control out 1500 feet um, at times. Uh, but, you know, common places we like to do uh, a control point every 500 foot, sometimes a thousand. It just depends on the circumstances of the, uh, of the project. But uh, we're certainly always getting at least a check shot. Um, that's what you're seeing here, those validation points every 500 foot. Um, and uh, it, it, it often makes sense to do what we call zipper method if, if it's a narrow enough corridor to where you don't have to set control on both sides, uh, one across from the other. You can kind of zipper your control down the road like that. Because as we all know, um, a couple of things with control. Number one, it can be time consuming um, to some degree, uh, you know, or what I mean to say is obviously we're trying to minimize the amount of time we have to put the boots on the ground and set that control. And for me, a big part of it is also safety. Um, so if I can, if I know I can spread my control out more because the terrain and the project allows that, I'm going to do all I can to keep my surveyors uh, off the side of a road as much as possible. Um, so again, just another example of a control layout. This is one. This one would be for large area mapping, but kind of table method. Um, photo IDs. Uh, Previous presenter I saw had some great photo ID uh, examples, and we are a, a fan of that, both with aerial drone, um, but also mobile mapping. So we try to use uh, existing markings and uh, other um, existing features when it makes sense on a project to minimize, again, the amount of effort on the roadside. So TBC uh, has some wonderful um, Wonderful uh, control 
capabilities. Um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, the ability to, cause we also, we have other software vendors, um, th- with our other, uh, tools that, um, don't quite have the flexibility that TBC does as far as, um, being able to look at your control point in three dimensions and overlay the imagery from the ladybug. So a lot of great functionality, um, from TBC tying down our data sets. Um, we, like the previous presenter, are big on validation. So this is just an example of uh, s- steps that are built into our software that we use for our data extraction um, that is giving us a few things. We can, uh, we can validate um, conventional ground truthing shots, GCP type, you know, uh, survey shots against the point cloud, like you're seeing here. We can also do it against the the ultimate DTM, which to me is very important because um, sometimes I fear that people validate their their point cloud and and they check that, but they don't validate their their DTM at the end, and their DTM was not derived properly with enough proper break lines. Um, and, and that's really, you know, you need to be checking that. And when you find, uh, and that's what the NSSDA check uh, spreadsheet and processes is, is all about. And so when you find bust in your DTM that don't, don't meet your accuracy standards, it's not necessarily that your point cloud's bad. It's that your uh, extraction folks did not derive enough break lines or enough detail to pass, the, to pass that. So quickly moving along here, uh, data prep, um, we get tons of big corridors with mobile mapping, so we have to tile it properly, and we've got great tools to do that. Um, here's just an example of a you know, 70 mile an hour data acquisition. I know some of these are hard to see through screenshots and things like that, but, um, and then classifying the data, here's an example of TBC's uh, classification tools, and uh, not only is TBC's uh software classifying it but then it's going a step further and it's like uh digitizing your assets so you here you're seeing trees being digitized both uh location height and uh vegetative spread there um into a gis or cad database so just uh, you know I, I wanted to pepper you guys with some different types of assets Extraction and analysis we do from mobile. Um, this one had mobile, but also had a, a lot of terrestrial because of the um, need, because it's a structural um, analysis. So an example of bridge analysis for a DOT, um, um, analyzing the columns, deformation on the column, make sure there's no twisting. So here's an example of a mobile data set. So on the left, you're seeing top-down plan view, all the extraction, CAD deliverable, you're seeing assets in there. And on your right, you're seeing the same data set as it moves through. And you can kind of see a green um, point of view here. So that matches what you're seeing in the camera. So this is a uh, about a 15 mile um, project, uh, urban project. And, uh, but, you know, 15 miles in how like say the engineer or the client may see it, but, uh, but for mo- for the mobile collection, it was more like 75 miles of of uh, drive lanes, you know, drive path uh, acquisition on it. Um, so when we think, so I'm going to kind of pepper you with uh, extraction and asset, and, and how we can utilize this mobile data to create um, whatever the end deliverable is for our clients. So here's an example of with a high quality with the MX nines um, high quality data set. Um, tied to survey control, we can uh, we have extraction software capabilities that can um, use a template, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say semi-automatically uh, extract uh, the curb and the guardrail of a uh, this is like a mile long bridge structure, and uh, so there's just a lot of uh, um, semi-automatic to automatic extraction that can be done with a mobile mapping data set um, that's done properly and uh, and again has good sensors on it and has a good internal system, INS system uh, 
producing a high quality point cloud for you. Um, so what all can you use mobile LiDAR for? That's kind of what this is showing you again. Uh, it's, this is kind of a slimmed down version of uh, the TRB breakdown, but I'm gonna show you some more examples here. So uh, let's see if this video will play for us. So utility extraction is an example that I think I had on my previous screen. So with a high quality mobile mapping data set, um, we have the ability through our software. Um, we use we utilize TopoDot, um, MX MX9, uh, Trimble, and TopoDot have worked closely through the years, and we we were already TopoDot users, and um, so uh, it made sense for us. That was another reason why we uh, were excited about going with this mobile mapping solution. And so this is an example of one of TopoDot's tools uh, where it's you're obviously uh, directing the, the power line um, for it. You're, you're uh, helping the software understand um, the direction of it. And then you're getting miles and miles of, uh, of power lines um, acquisition done. So extraction. So moving on to the next example, um, I wanted to highlight the asset extraction portion of it. So, uh, so um, think signs and power poles and things like that. So you bring in a high quality mobile mapping data set, you let the software analyze it, um, you give it some uh, additional information and uh, tell it what type of cells, um, you know, you have a cell temperate library and it will uh, chew through that mobile mapping data set and drop your um, your CAD blocks for you. Um, so we utilize a lot of these tools on our on our corridor jobs. Here's another example. Um, again, you've uh, you've built a a cell template, uh, uh, or for your auto, for the AutoCAD users, a CAD um, block template, and you fed that into the software. And because you have a high quality uh, mobile mapping data set. Um, the software is able to analyze it and uh, and drop these blocks and digitize that for you. So here's an ex here's an example of a project I'm going to show you here in a little bit of where we were able to use these uh, semi-automatic tools to digitize all of our assets along the road. Um, I'm not able to show you in this the pavement marking striping um, capabilities, uh, but the one you just previously saw, it's very similar where, because the point cloud is such high quality, the, uh, the intensity is uh, easily managed by the software. And so it, you click and it, it traces your striping for you. Um, so another thing we love about the MX-9 is the, the the accuracy of the data relative to itself is is such at a uh, precise and a dense model that um, the software I, I continue to show you is able to do uh, pavement condition index analysis. So uh, not only can it chew through the point cloud and uh, and uh, analyze it, but it will build out. Um, uh, GIS attribute tables that we have fed into GIS um, web maps and uh, you know you can hand over a, a municipality all of their roads um, and it, so that they can analyze it and understand the quality of their roads and if they want to drill into a specific area for uh, for analysis they can. Um, I also wanted to showcase that you know, for our GIS people out there, these tools, this information will plug into Esri software as well. So um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but that same concept of being able to use the ladybug imagery, it plugs into your art map or your, um, your Esri tools and our GIS folks can jump into there and uh, extract assets as they see fit into a GIS. Um, platform. So you don't have to be necessarily a CAD user to uh, ingest um, this mobile mapping 
information. So I wanted to just give our uh, GIS folks a little bit of love there. Um, and obviously, you know, if, uh, if it is for GIS applications, uh, sometimes survey control can be uh, minimized uh, very much. So uh, I like to, again, talk about blending all these data sets together so that we can build a complete um, point cloud and uh, we can we can turn that in as a deliverable and feel confident that we have not left any holes. Um, sometimes there, you know, it's just so much vegetation that you, you, you have to fill that with conventional data. And we always, we always use that when necessary. So here's an example of uh, road data, drone data, uh, road, mobile LIDAR, um, uh, drone LIDAR and bathymetric data all pulled into one. Um, so why, again, why do you need to use it? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons. As I was talking earlier, sometimes maybe with mobile mapping or with another method, your, the angle at which your sensor is going to hit, which I'll talk about here in a second, isn't quite where you want it to be. Uh, vegetation can, could be an issue. Um, safety for utility capture. I showed some of our utility extraction tools. Obviously, um, if we can keep people out of the road to do utility extraction, we want to do that. Um, so as far as angle of incident goes, we're always thinking about the terrain. You know, you try to make that digital site visit before you do, do a data collection and uh, understand the terrain and uh, understand some issues that you might run into. So if it is a mobile job, you try and plan your, uh, your, your driving um, properly to where you get good data sets. And uh, as I said, sometimes it's necessary to uh, to utilize maybe drone LIDAR with it to uh, fill in some areas that aren't seen, aren't able to be seen from the roadside. And then, uh, like I said, the terrestrial, we will utilize under bridges or uh, I'll show an example of a construction site here in a second. Um, and then footprint, you know, so how, if, if we are doing an aerial acquisition, you know, how much overlap do we need? How, uh, how big is the area? There's a lot of thoughts that go into manned aircraft versus drone acquisition um, and how we wanna collect that. And then, like I said, just general line of sight issues that you might run into. Here's an example of a construction site. Um, this was again, that, that 15 mile uh, urban mobile mapping job um, where we had a, a couple of construction zones and so we used our terrestrial scanner and set up on the other side of that. And because we're using survey control properly and we have good acquisition tools, we can easily blend uh, our point clouds and uh, close any gaps. So you're seeing the blue here is the mobile mapping and the red is a terrestrial data set. And so we can extract uh, a good CAD deliverable for the client. Um, Vegetation is a is a, always a concern, and as I've said a couple of times, so one thing that's interesting to for people to see is on the right. I'm not sure how clearly you guys can see it, but the green is a uh, is photogrammetric uh, photogrammetric point cloud, and the white, which is really hard to see, is a uh, lidar point cloud, and this just represents like why, um, and you're, this is a cross section through some trees and there's a little channel here. And so this is an example of why we uh, use LIDAR and not photogram photogrammetry um, all the time. And the green, those orange dots you're seeing there is our DTM grid and how we were able to use the LIDAR to uh, derive that. And again, the utility capture side of it, safety first. Um, it's a huge reason why you might use different types of, uh, of acquisition and blend a hybrid data set. So here's a project example that I spoke to a couple times. Um, pretty huge mobile collection, um, but we also used uh, drone information and we used terrestrial information. On this one, we didn't have to do any bathymetric stuff, didn't run into any of those issues. But uh, so here are some examples of blending um, the ladybug imagery, you're seeing the ladybug imagery and the CAD 
that was derived from the point cloud kind of blended together. And here's a top down where you're seeing uh, the drone imagery that was um, utilized for different things. One of the reasons, one of the um, uses for the drone imagery because it because it's such high resolution, we were able to utilize it to pull out um, utility markings. And so using that in collaboration with conventional utility survey work and, uh, and all the um, information you get from the utility providers, um, we were able to use the drone imagery to uh, um, further extract our utility information. And, uh, and I mean, anytime you can get high res drone imagery, most surveyors would love to have it. So we use that on the corridor. Here's an example of the DTM derived from it. Um, another similar view from, uh, from one like I showed you earlier where you're seeing all the topography derived and then the DF DTM um, triangle file created from that. And I wanted to wrap, as I wrap up, I wanted to talk about Trimble's, um, I mentioned the ladybug viewing software and how important that kind of street view like real time information is. But to me, it continues to push towards a web deliverable for that. So uh, Trimble, Trimble's MX uh, web delivery, you know, being able to send your engineers um, a web link where they can jump in, view the imagery, which is huge in itself, but then also being able to view the point cloud and then to take it even a step further from that street view like view, being able to do them to do some measurements so that, you know, in a sense, you can go acquire all this information, bring it back to the office. You can, um, you know, kind of with the, the asterisk small print with the, the engineer say, hey, I'm going to hand over what we just acquired and you can start using that in a preliminary manner. Um, and you got to kind of drive home the preliminary side of it. But they can start kind of doing some initial planning of their engineering while you're deriving, uh, deriving the survey. Because from my experiences on the design side, often I would get feedback from, you know, what's your pain point as an engineer and they, as far as survey goes? And they would obviously say that the weight. And so this is a great tool for uh, you to be able to hand them over all the information that's out in the field and let them use it to kind of start an initial um, uh, piece there. So always have to wrap up with accuracies. Uh, um, obviously, this is only as good as the survey that you set. You know, there's let. You know, are you are you running levels through it? Um, how many times did you did you? Uh, how long did you run your your base? How how many times did you check into your control? I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. But generally speaking, here are some values of, of what we expect um, from our systems. Obviously, the terrestrial lidar because it's um, there's no motion um, involved is the tool that we push out there if we're doing um, like a structural analysis. But generally speaking uh, with our mobile system, we're getting, uh, you know, five millimeters. Um, and we're, we're, getting, we're getting excellent data sets uh, if we use proper survey control um, and, uh, and tie it properly. So, with that, Billy, I'll let you jump in and wrap things up, and we can maybe take a few questions. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. Billy, you have five great, minutes. Yep. Great presentation. Um, got five minutes here. Just going to run through this quick summary. Uh, geospaces, uh, uh, geospatial services are redefined in data collection methods industry-wide, as uh, Rusty kind of showed us there. Um, one of the major things that we're spending – less field in the time collecting data, but more time in the office processing data. And for me as a land surveyor myself, you know, spending more la less time in the field is keeping those boots on the ground and out of harm's way and out of, um, you know, out of those busy intersections with the mobile mapping system. There's larger dem demands on the IT infrastructure to support heavy spatial data sets. Um, Computers and storage space is getting, you know, bigger and bigger every day and cheaper coming down. You know, we can, we can handle those data, data needs. Um, definitely offering more 
of a demand on technicians for more encompassing skill sets, which I feel like that's a great uh, thing coming about in the surveying world. We got all this great technology um, survey as a land surveyor myself. I feel like we, we need to tap into our younger generation and get surveyors more involved in this. And I think this new technology is going to start bringing them our way. Uh, it's creating new jobs in the entire market segments of breakneck speeds, uh, data mining and collection, collection as Rusty was showing you there, definitely saves time on a project and, uh, and expenses overall where, where, you know, those budgets and um, project uh, deadlines are definitely what we hope to meet. So with that, we, um, we, we are excited that we got to present here today with you guys. And, uh, you guys have any questions, uh, Gavin, we'll give it back to you. There's our contact information. And again, thanks again. Wonderful presentation. And Rusty, uh, all of those real world examples is, uh, you know, there's people skeptical about the mobile systems and when they're starting to see more and more real world examples. And I really appreciate that you wrapped up with the accuracy. That's one of the first questions. A uh, quick question for Billy though. Um, are you seeing a mix of people buying and renting, leasing these systems, or is it mainly purchase? Uh, we, um, there is a lot of rental going on. These systems are definitely in a different price range to get a mobile mapping system. So renting a mobile mapping system to kind of get your feet wet and kind of go out and test it on a project is something that we see people doing. But um, I think as they get more and more into it and see the benefit and the cost savings of um, owning a system themselves. Um, you're going to, we're going to find more users actually purchasing the system. Okay. And uh, the other thing was about training. I know that one of the tough parts as I struggle with it is the post-processing mobile. Uh, there's a bit of an art to it, you know, with pause pack, you know, you're running your PPK forward and back and then forward again. And then, um, do you find people, uh, you know, want a little bit of help with that? Or do you, you know, do you provide that service for them if that's the tough part? We do provide that service. Uh, we, we back up, like I said, we back up half with our technical support and definitely do, we do provide that service as a support to um, anyone that needs that um, support uh, with pause pack as well. And combining that with TV, TVC and moving the data from pause pack into TBC and then out to those third party softwares, we can kind of run that workflow with our customers. So for those unfamiliar with the term TBC, that's Trimble Business Center. It's the, uh, the office software. Yeah, that's correct. Short that of, is all, all, yeah, all kinds of different uh, add-ons and modules like other office softwares as well. Right. Right. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you again. Uh, and then you guys, uh, you, your Trimble shop. So we got to, give a plug and a thanks to Trimble for being one of the sponsors of this event as well. Uh, uh, Rusty, it'd be really interesting to do a session in a, in a uh, you know, subsequent uh, VCX about the pluses and minuses uh, that you're finding through, through end use of, of uh, image-based and, and LIDAR. They both have pluses and minuses, so. I agree. Thanks, gentlemen. So yeah. we're going to move, we're going to move on.